Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today with the Clinician Engineer Hub, Bridging the Gap Between Medicine and Engineering. And I'm super excited to have a very special guest here with us today, live from his car, because he's always on the go. We have Cola Teitler here, a medical doctor from King's and entrepreneur based in Cambridge. He's also the founder of Dropout Milano in 2018. And I won't reveal the product, I'll allow him to do that, but it's a very interesting product where he also utilized data analytics and engineering techniques to aid in the marketing and sales process. He was recently featured in Forbes 30 Under 30. And I think if I'm right, you've just returned from Cincinnati. Is that correct, Colin? Yeah, yeah, I have. Fantastic. It's very exciting. I know how busy you are, so uh, I won't waste too much of your time. If you'd like to give a brief background to the audience, um, explain a bit more, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, thank you for having me, um, you know, first of all. So, um, you know, without giving a whole uh, novel of my of my life story, but I was uh, I was born in London, but I actually grew up in Italy, in Rome, uh, near Rome. And I moved to the back to the UK in um, you know London for medical school, where I studied at King's College London. Um, during medical school, I realized quite soon, actually, that probably... Um, you know, a lot of the people around me and a lot of my interests weren't necessarily aligned with other medical students. So I expanded my network a lot within sports, within uh, fashion, within music. Um, and during medical school, I got in touch online, actually, initially with uh, some individuals which were founders of um, online communities, mostly related to streetwear and, and sneakers. And that sort of spiraled and fueled my interest, you know, within those worlds, aside, uh, you know, the, the medical sphere. Um, that interest really, um, you know, took off, I think maybe in sort of year three and four of, uh, of my medical school journey. And I ended up, uh, um, you know, initially running a blog, uh, online with, you know, one of those guys and it became really popular. So, um, you know, yeah, the hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram, Twitter, and that really gave me a grasp of, you know, the importance of marketing and the importance of understanding your audience, you know, how you're speaking to them, what you're serving and how you're serving and, you know, and why, um, and ultimately, you know, that also sort of um, ignited in me the interest for, for data, you know, and how uh, to reach the best decision, you know, around, uh, um, you know, a process when you have uncertainty and when you have, uh, you know, perhaps a lack of, of um, you know, of, of, uh, of certain information. So, you know, that really, you know, was sort of my intro, uh, you know, to a different world for medicine during medical school. Uh, I ended up opening a business you know we're still in medical school um you know business been running now for over six years um qualified as a doctor always worked pretty much always worked pretty much always in london um and then yeah i did uh, after medical school i did another degree i did an mba at the university of birmingham uh and now i'm following a, another master degree at the university of cambridge um a master in entrepreneurship amazing it's uh, it's incredible how you have all the time to to do all this and uh <laughs> I wanted to ask you, so obviously, you know, in doctoring, uh, we sometimes have a tunnel vision that we're a doctor and, and all we should be doing is uh, diagnosing and treating patients. But I think we're quite gifted in that we we have a lot of other interests. We pick up things quite easily. The, the pace of learning now is very different to how it used to be. Was there any resistance maybe when you were discussing with supervisors during your training that, oh, I'm also an entrepreneur and I have a side gig? Uh, I think we are getting better, but uh, I think when I started, it was it was kind of frowned upon. <laughs> I, I think to an extent, um, you know, to an extent they could have been, but equally, if there was there, I probably didn't take much, pay much attention to it. Mostly because ultimately, you know, to me, the goal in life is to be happy and satisfied. And, you know, there's no supervision or, you know, trainer or whatever that can, you know, sort of decide or dictate how I'm going to, you know, sort of, leave that aspect of my life and yeah. i would say however that you know the key for me was actually um you know beyond the medical school part where you know i did have certainly have a lot of challenges and part of the frustration led me in fact to start a business but during you know actual the, the medical career journey um being always you know like up to date with the portfolio and always like you know ensuring that you are uh you know sort of focusing where that you're not um you know like sort of making errors you know or you know, Know, sort of errors that you should be making uh mm. i think that that is i think is very important so you know ultimately like you know we we have a responsibility we have you know patient safety is the first 
you know, sort of uh, utmost, uh, um, you know, criterion of our work. And uh, um, I think, you know, that that has, has to remain so and rightly so. So I think that, you know, if, if you know, I think if my bench or whatever were uh, impacting on what I was doing clinically, I think that probably, you know, I would have felt a fair resistance, but I think that's never been the case. And actually, uh, I felt, uh, you know, at some point, and when I asked, for example, during my MBA, <laughs> when I asked for study leave for the dissertation, you know, they were like, oh, you know, are you sure that you're going to be able to? But then when I was like, you know, yeah. I'm I'm fine and you know I know who to ask for you know if I need I think they they were you know they they were pretty good so from that point of view I think uh, I think definitely you need to be wary definitely there can be challenges but ultimately I think you know you need to realize and you need to be honest with, with yourself you know if you think you can balance and you can relay the message I think you know that's 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 fine. Fantastic. So on to the products of trainers and sneakers. So um, I think when I was younger I used to be into uh, Converse. <laughs> mm. now as i get older i'm I'm into sketches i think it just helps with uh, all the uh, joint pains and things mm. but uh i know that you know you're very hot on the data analytics in terms of the selling and the marketing for our audience would you mind explaining a bit about that as well yeah yeah so um essentially i think you know what uh something i obviously i touched on a little bit earlier was that um that, that journey of the, uh, you know, sort of understanding the public and so on, it led me to, to, to you know, to, to see how, uh, you know, especially when you have a really large public and you have, say, you know, like a set amount of, you know, money or a set amount of, you know, resources, in fact, which could be human resources as well. You want ideally to maximize your chances of success. You want ideally to maximize your chances of profit. You want ideally to, you know, maximize your chances of, um, you know, utilizing efficiently what you have. And I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that for me transformed in, uh, you know, looking at the market and the industry that we were operating in and uh, determining whether there was any way in which, you know, we could use data to, uh, you know, make more objective and, and solid decisions. And what I realized was that, you know, human emotions, especially anger, sadness, but also excitement, they actually condition and they certainly impact, you know, the way, you know, your decision-making process. Therefore, I thought actually, you know, if I can find objective data and I can, and, and I can analyze that, um, you know, without really sort of taking out the, you know, the, the emotional component, I might be onto something. I might be able to make maybe slightly better decisions that I would make otherwise. So what we did, we essentially initially wrote pretty much a scraper where, you know, we were looking at market data available, publicly available online for, uh, for for sneakers on secondary market. And then we started plotting those into, into tables. And uh, once we had a, you know, a sort of vast set of, of data, we started looking at the, the change of the data over a certain period of time. We looked into some, uh, some statistical model and, you know, sort of uh, analytic the regression especially to determine whether there was any trends uh, and based on the trends we were looking for pattern and the idea was that we will compare products with each other now the, the ultimate idea would have been initially to predict you know how fastly sort of you know the price of a product of a commodity was rising uh, this was particularly for sneakers and certain streetwear items however there's some confounding factors which are um, you know, restocks, uh, you know, celebrity announcements or anything of that kind which can impact the market. However, as a whole we realized that because some of those were relatively predictable and known anyway, we were able to develop, design a system where we would have, uh, you know, we would be able to compare the trends of different products with each other. And that, you know, will give us in a market with hundreds and hundreds of products an idea as to which ones seem to be rising at a faster pace, more predictably, and could be, you know, number one, a better investment, and secondly, a better, um, you know, sort of buy for our, for our venture. Because, most businesses, or rather, well, actually, I, I can't say most, but a lot of businesses in the fashion industries, they suffer the problem of excess inventory. And a lot of the issues from that stem from the fact that you don't really know how much you should buy. You don't really know when you should buy. You don't really know what people want. And our idea was to, you know, target that by having better understanding of the demand and by having better understanding of actually, you know, sort of uh, how much people are willing to pay and, you know, whether there was a difference in that. Um, we, we definitely... We definitely learned a lot, uh, you know, during 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 this journey, and I think that um, you know that pretty much was ultimately at the base of you know of dropout, uh, because we noted that okay, you know, we now have all this data, and you know, we sort of you know we have we have an understanding of how many people um, you know sort of uh, 
you know, browse the products, how many people browse X products and whether, you know, certain colors sell better or certain brands sell, sell, sell better or whether, you know, there's a seasonal variant. So we use all of this. We put it into, you know, a, a sort of um, high street venture and we open a business uh, in, in Milan, Italy, mostly for because, um, you know, it was a little bit less competitive. <laughs> Sorry? Fashion capital, I guess. Yeah, correct. Absolutely. Then, yeah, certainly, you know, fashion capital. I, I speak oh. Italian. There wasn't, there wasn't anything remotely similar in Italy. In Italy, and also the thing is that uh, in places like London, sometimes you know you will be competing with companies that can afford to lose money for a long period of time before turning a profit. And in Milan, that's that was less likely. And essentially, you know, we did, we know we because it was bootstrapped. Every pound, every euro is really counted. Therefore, you know, we didn't, you know, we, we had to make it work. And yes, the data, but obviously, ultimately, you know, the data is not a guarantee of success. The data is about maximizing your chances of success. And really, uh, you know, especially in retail, because the fixed costs are so high, um, you know, you're always one quarter, two quarters away from, you know, difficult waters. And, uh, you know, that really, you know, taught us that, you know, we needed to be careful. Therefore, uh, you know, we decided to open there, uh, you know, initially it was in a particular area. Then later on, we moved into a more luxury, um, you know, fashion area. Mm. And that, you know, really, really, you know, sort of, again, really helped. Um, but, you know, it's been, a, it's been a journey, certainly, you know, it's been a lot of, there's been a lot of learning, been a lot of, um, you know, ups and downs, obviously. Uh, the pandemic, you know, we had to be closed for 11 months across 2020 and 2021. But, um, you know, again, so it's business and certainly so it's entrepreneurship. The, the, the nature of the game no that's really impressive i mean i think you know this is this is fashion engineering i guess you have a passion for a product there's definitely a gap in the market you've done market analysis uh and, and you've looked at the data and, and that's been used to guide you but not so, sort of be definitive it's but it's there as, as a kind of cushion exactly and, certainly um you know i'm sure our audience would appreciate any final tips for the budding entrepreneurs in the sort of clinician engineering space i think from a you know i i could say um you know to, to an extent a little bit skewed in the sense that a lot of knowledge that i have now you know a lot of also knowledge has been a little bit more formal because obviously i then later on underwent some training uh you know some business training and you know i did some like yourself i've done obviously you know some more much more um structured you know understanding therefore um, you know, I think some so there's some of that on some of that knowledge. I think you know, depending on where you're at, uh, certainly try trying to understand your consumer really is key. I think for me initially the very good thing was that I was a very strong consumer in uh, you know the the market where we operated. So I had a really really solid understanding, and because of the blog that I'd run, I'd you know I'd been in touch with the communities, I'd been you know um, you know I'd been seeing the development of the of the of the segment and the niche um you know like from from the inside and i think that that, that really was definitely key for for us mm. um i would say you know really understanding the, the the customer really understanding if there is a community community will be a driver and a cheaper driver because actually you know word of mouth you know referrals they are cheaper they're probably more effective they're probably more more trustworthy than you know the digital ads that you know you'll need to run they are more effective than the billboards you know that we are bombarded with so many you know so much content nowadays so definitely i would say you know focus on that um economics is quite important and again you know having obviously you know unit economics especially if it is a you know consumer business um or you know if it is a you know sort of you know, B2C or D2C business especially, um, and really make sure that, you know, you have the understanding of that. And if you think that, you know, it's something that you'll need to develop later on, have an idea as to how you will get, you know, to the profitability to, you know, break even, especially you know, if you're going to need to look for, for future funding or, you know, or anything of that kind. Because ultimately, you know, I, I was in a talk fairly recently where someone made a really good point that said, mm -hmm. if you go to an investor and the investor, you know, doesn't want to, you know, and investors say that they don't invest. The likelihood is that, you know, they just don't invest in that opportunity. And it could be that the opportunity is not good enough or it could be that it's the way that you present it. Therefore, you know, maybe have a think about that as well. And ultimately, I think that, you know, sometimes having a think, not to raise money just to raise money, but because, you know, it really doesn't help you to actually ensure that you have a structured, solid, systematic approach, which again, is not a guarantee of success, but again, you know, it's something that hopefully will increase your likelihood of success and staying in the game for longer and hopefully, you know, until you know until you want no that's really good and, and i agree with uh, your final point for sure i think sometimes in the startup space people are like oh where are the funds coming from we must approach angels and vcs but mm. you know if you've got a solid product the money will come right so i think 
Uh, it's very helpful advice there. Well, thanks so much, Carla, and uh, appreciate how busy you are and that you had the time to uh, share your journey with us. I think it's really incredible. Doctor, entrepreneur, engineering, and Forbes 30 under 30. Well, but thank you. Well, you're, you're, you're most welcome. Probably, probably Vogue. <laughs> All right, Carla. <Cole. laughs> we'll see. <Okay>. We'll see. <laughs> see you stay, next time. Stay tuned. <laughs> for sure. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining, everyone. Sure. Take care. Bye. Bye.